One, two, three, four. This is Bill Ray, one of the best drummers in Seattle. Last year after my accident, Bill threw me some gigs he couldn't make, which really built up my confidence. Bill grew up in Mississippi with his drummer dad. He eventually moved to California to pursue his drumming dream. While in Orange County, Bill taught Adrian Young of No Doubt and Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters. Later on, Bill was hired to play for Ike Turner's band. Ike called him the drummer of my soul. Currently, Bill plays for Paul Gilbert of Mr. Big and Racer X fame, as well as teaching at his Seattle area studio. Check out BillRayDrums.com for more info. Let's meet him. <laughs> yeah, you do a real time. Uh, what is that? Just three retail, real time lessons? What's that all about? Uh, you know, I just get on. It's it started out as a way for me to sort of, you know, get a level of accountability for practice because, you know, I tend to be a little bit. Uh, I can sort of slack off. I'm in that yeah. age where, you know, I'm over 50. And if I don't like get up and, and push the wheel every day, then, you know, my stuff starts to uh, freeze up a little bit, you know? Sure. I, would, I mean, if you, you understand, you know, have back if you, you know, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I have to sit down and literally force myself some days to, you know, swing sticks. And, and it's a lot harder than others because, know maybe my hands are just feeling a little crappy and, and sticky and you know like achy mostly yeah but, uh, Before, that's kind of why I started this uh, new channel um, just yeah. talking about how to maintain your health and if you're a working musician and you know coming back from injuries and stuff like that um, first I did want to thank you for the uh, networking with me last year for those those gigs it was really nice of you you're quite oh, Donna's really talented yeah, yeah she's something else isn't she mm -hmm. yeah she's a uh, quite very easily uh probably well no there's no probably about it she's definitely the best vocalist i've ever worked with in my life wow and she's very detailed you can tell how hard she works behind the scenes um and yeah. uh yeah that shows up at, at rehearsal too um so i mean we don't know each other that well i'm trying to familiarize myself with you besides just drummers in town you know helping each other out with gigs and stuff like that so um, the channel is called Drum Recovery Network. Um, I currently play with Duff McKagan and his band Loaded when he's not doing Guns N' Roses. Um, Roger Fisher of Heart, Vendetta Red, other other stuff. And I have a little school called Loud House out here in the behind Squawk Mountain where I teach you know little kids beginning and intermediate stuff. Nice. Um, but I do know that you are one of uh, you know in town. You are one of the A listers. So um, I'm privileged to have you um, just contribute. It, you know, this doesn't have to take too long, but I'm glad you took the time. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, so I just want to do like a real lightning quick bio, if, if you didn't mind. We don't have to go through the whole life story, but um, like uh, I, I read a little bit of your bio. You, you started really young and um, you fell in love with the drums really quick. Did you, did you go into private lessons right away? I took lessons from a man named Sonny Hill at a place called Warlines Music in Jackson, Mississippi. And yeah. that was, uh, the, the lessons probably lasted two months. And I remember stick control. And I remember there being a, uh, one of those old practice kits that had, you know, the, the drum pads. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and I wanted to play that kit. And he never would let me go near it. And it was just like, but I've got a real drum set at home. My father was a drummer and he set up oh, okay. Ludwig's that, that I ended up inheriting and, and passing on to my son as well. So, wow. Kind of a family heirloom. That, that's a cool kid. At 1961, a uh, set of uh, the Joe Morello series of uh, Ludwig's. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Totally unique kid. And then, uh, you know, you, then, then you just took off. You, you never let the drums go. You got uh, obsessed about it. You, you probably spent a lot of time by yourself um that's what we do getting better <laughs> yeah and that's when you spend a lot of time by yourself you know away from your friends you're really concentrating on the drums 
you come back, I, I'm sure you have this story too, but you might've had other friends who were liked the drums and were playing, but they had other interests, but you just stuck with the drums and you come back every period of time and they're like, wow, what happened? That so, does, <laughs> well, I mean, as you're, you're, as you're a young player coming up, you know, you, you know especially uh, in, in your uh, age group and I think, uh, geography and, and where you live has a lot to do with it because in, in Jackson, Mississippi in the 1980s, there really wasn't much to do except uh, get in trouble or <laughs> stay out of trouble. <laughs> and staying in the house, um, you know, my mother, uh, she used to have to uh, pay me to leave when she wanted to have like date night with her, you know, her husband. She's like, uh, extra allowance you want to hear here's here's 20 bucks go to the movies tonight i'm like oh i was gonna have a jam session tonight mom uh, no 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 more jams tonight <laughs> that's kind of how it went so um yeah it was it was just all of you know i i would pretty much just sequester myself to the to the basement and and just play 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 to records and your favorite stuff what was your favorite stuff like really early on Really early on, I think uh, I remember, you know, being most enamored by Kiss. My father was a jazz drummer, and I grew up around, you know, the, the Church of Elvin Jones and uh, Art Blakey and uh, all that. And I heard those guys, and my dad was a big jazz head, so I listened to a lot of that. And, and my mom was into R&B, so I listened to a lot of that. But then when I discovered Kiss, it was kind of like my music, and, and then I got off into that. And uh, then uh, over the years, I got into the heavy metal, the thrash metal of the eighties, the early eighties, you know, like yeah. I was the guy who brought Metallica to my school in Mississippi. No one had ever heard of them. They were, mm -hmm. everybody was into Motley Crue and, and all the hair metal stuff. And then I found Metallica and Anthrax. And, and then once, you know, everybody started getting into that, then I was like, well, geez, that's no fun. So I found some other kind of music. It was jazz fusion. I discovered Billy Cobham and Dave Weckl and Vinnie Caliuta and, and then all of a sudden my taste just completely did, you know, 180 degrees. And now all of a sudden I just want to learn as much as I can. And uh, then I moved to California when I was uh, uh, 20. And when I moved to California, it was, you know, I had never taken formal lessons beyond uh, just the ones that I had earlier on, when, you know, early on in my, uh, in my development. And when I went to California, I realized, there's some freaking amazing players here, man. I mean, I, I'm going to sink to the bottom if I don't get my ass in gear. So yeah. I went and I started, you know, haranguing local drum stores and drum teachers and asking, you know, uh, just begging lessons off of them because I didn't have any money at the time, you know, and I was like, can you show me something cool? And I would just get that piece of knowledge. Like George Lawrence was my, like the second teacher. And I never really studied formally with him, but I would just, you know, kind of beg a thing off of him here and there when he was, you know, in between lessons with Keith Carlock because he was Keith's first teacher as well. So, you know, I, I took the different route. I would just kind of hang around and ask things and, and just absorb it and then work it 20 different ways. So uh, when I learned in California that if I didn't learn how to read music, then, uh, then I was kind of going to put myself at a disadvantage. So I had to learn to do that. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, the natural progression as a drummer of your influences. Um, I just had my first drum hero on a couple of weeks ago, Martin Chambers of the Pretenders. Oh, God, he's great. Oh. I know. I had him on for like an hour and 20 minutes. It was like blowing my mind. <laughs> Such a powerhouse he'd be with the Pretenders. Yeah. So I started out um, loving New Wave, uh, K-Rock 106.7 in Los Angeles. I grew up in Orange County. And, cool. Um, so I was New Wave, New Wave, teaching myself the drums. And then there came a point where it, I just moved on like, oh, there's, there's this band, uh, LSC. I love Missing Persons and, and you know, Bozio was like blowing my mind and they kind of crossed over from, you know, math rock and pop. And then I had, a, I had an argument as, as it, I had a, my first job was at Wiener Schnitzel and, and one of the cooks was like, no man, Bozio's nothing. You got to listen to this Rush band. You got to listen to Neil Peart. And I was like, no, what are you talking about? We had like this little organized. So I gave him Missing Persons and he gave me Rush. And I went home and I was like, oh my God, this is a different portal. So I got into Rush and Yes. And then from Yes, like King Crimson and the colored records through the 80s. Oh, and yeah. I was like, I'm a different, I was in a, I was going down a different portal, you know, and it was, it's really, and it just builds your skills, you know, this foundation of this rock and new wave. And now I'm like, I have to count. There's counting that needs to be done. Of course, yeah. 
template. And you know, after as you as you go in your progression of being being a, a professional drummer, you know, I speak specifically to the drums because I just play drums. I you know that I don't play any other instruments. But the one thing I have come to the realization, and it took me a long time to do this, was that uh, what drummer's job is is uh, we draw lines in the coloring book for everybody else to to you know scribble in their melodic. Uh, ideas and concepts so we're the ones that sort of define the edges around you know uh the picture that's being created yeah and then yeah. you get guys like who do it all like who have the who have the vision from the start you know phil collins peter gabriel whatever who like started out as drummers and they can already hear the end product because yeah they're drummers and they know the way the flow should go yeah we we draw you know we create uh the caricature so you know for for a long time i used to joke with myself i'd be uh, sitting at a gig playing uh, just the most boring cocktail jazz, you know, just counting the minutes, you know, and, and it got to be so boring after a while that, you know, you're, you're just playing, you know, here we are doing another boss or we're playing girl from Ipanema. So I started looking around the room and this one place we were playing had all this crazy weird artwork. Like there was some, you know, cubism over here and there were some abstracts over there. And I would literally get inside of the painting and see if I could pull any kind of like, visual stimulation from that and begin uh you know uh sort of blending with the painting to you know to sort of bridge to take my mind off of the mundanity of the moment and to go find something uh to do to give my brain something to chew on at the moment because you know i'm just uh, sitting over here just basically watching paint dry is what it boils down to <laughs> then i started thinking about drawing caricatures and that's one of the things that helped me learn songs along the way was that I would just say, okay, this right here, this is a Bugs Bunny type uh, tune. You know, it's got the particular changes and, you know, it's got ears on the top and it's got certain forms and, you know, then you can pose it. It's like, here's Bugs Bunny with a carrot as a cigar, you know. Well, let's put Fred Flintstone feet on Bugs Bunny and then, you know, you can start mixing genres and styles. And yeah. So, a very visualization sort of uh, uh, synesthetic sort of thing. That sounds like the way I map out. Um, well, I fill in for that Dr. Funk band every once in a while when Ben can't do it. And uh, that's kind of how I map out a two hour show is I, I do my own chicken scratch. I mean, there's some notation in there, but a lot of times I just describe things in phrases like, you know, two measures from now, you know, do the uh, hollow notes bridge from blah, 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 you know, and I, I write it in just, it's a totally original thing. And that, that's, that's interesting the way you, you bring art into that. Yeah, well, it's all art, you know. And music is uh, music is the sonic uh, embodiment of uh, of like you know uh, a painting or uh, something like that. Something that you know you could see. It's the sonic embodiment of of a visual element. Yeah. Do you remember your first gig that you thought um, I feel like a pro now? Yeah, I think it was the first gig, and I just probably uh, sort of like rhythmically vomited all over everything, and I was like. <laughs> Bro, and the band leader's like, don't ever call him again. <laughs> wow. No, I, I do remember the, the first gig that I got my, uh, got my butt kicked continuously. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in the South, and, and there's something about New Orleans musicians and, and Louisiana musicians that, uh, like, I could feel I could play in the slowest beat that I could be playing, and they still look over me, and they're like, man, you Russian. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you know the drag. I mean, it's it's like you, you can't play it slow enough, so you almost have to like purposely drag it. And then they look around, they're like, "Yeah, you know." Wow. I had a whole week into that, just just grinding my teeth, and uh, then I realized, you know what? That's what a professional does. They surrender their ego, and they surrender what they feel like they want to do, and they give the moment and the music what needs to happen in that spot, and. Uh, they, they freely give that and, and that's what a professional musician does is to deliver, you know, to, to draw the lines that need to be drawn. I think that's okay to have your style. You're a pusher, you're a dragger. You know, I, I remember, I never saw the movie, but I remember the trailer for um, that drumming movie. Yeah. And the, and the, the teacher was like, are you a, pu are you a pusher or a dragger? And he's like yelling in his face. And I was thinking like both, like they both work like, why are you getting pissed off? Like it, it's okay to have a style, but of course, if you're in a professional situation where you're relied on like really laying it down, 
um, yeah, giving up that ego, um, that you know, that's the part that takes discipline. Maybe, maybe you are normally a pusher, you know, like Trey Cole from Green Day or something. I have a story about Bonham it. sits back a, a bit, you know, but when you go into a room full of strangers and it's a paid gig, you know, you have to, you have to check in, check your ego out. And, you know, that's, that's the pro part, you know, take direction. Take direction. Per, yeah. Exactly. You know, and, and there are people who are very sensitive to that. Some people are, are extremely sensitive to tempo changes and some people don't even care. You know, they're just happy to be, you know, floating in the groove with you. But there's some people that are so, you know, like they've got such a grasp on control. They, you know, micromanagement of it. Um, I have a, a app on my phone called uh, Live BPM. And what that does, it's, a, it's like a speedometer. And it, it gathers the, the mean tempo of all the, you know, the, the spike points that are happening. It listens to the whole entire band. Yeah. And then it spits out the tempo you're playing at. And the oh. beautiful thing about that is, is that, you know, I could put it on my kit and, or put it next to my kit or on my music stand or something. And, you know, if a band leader is telling me, you know, like you're Russian, I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, and he says it to me like twice, maybe three times. I'll go, okay, hang on. I'll break out my phone and I'll open it up and I'll sit it there and I'll say, okay, I'm going to keep an eye on this. And you realize, you start to realize, you know, okay, if I do this right here, if I hold here, then everything will hold together. But then you hear who's rushing and it's usually the guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> At least in my experience, when band, you know, when I'm with a band that, that does that, it's a, he was a, he's a local musician up in, uh, in the uh, Snohomish County area. And I won't name any names, you know, yeah as a band and and i played with that band for a minute and and his guitar player great player but the dude just like he's at the end of the solo you know before the rest of us are and and then the band leader and he are such you know intertwined they're you know yeah. writing so it's like it's not my fault that you know that we didn't get there in time or or you know it's it basically that that app really so uh, that's the argument ender i call it <laughs> mm -hmm. Did yeah. Ben ever tell you the the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame story with Paul Schaefer? No, no. Yeah. Is um, I just had a little interview with Ben a couple of days ago, and I thought it was really interesting. So the house band and Paul Schaefer was the director, and um, Randy Newman was the singer, and then Steve Ferroni was the drummer. And he was just saying Ben was off to the side, but in the middle of the song when they're rehearsing. Um, uh, Randy Newman said, "Oh no, everyone stop, stop, stop! Steve, you're rushing, you're rushing." You know, to me, when I think of Steve Ferroni, I think rock solid, total pocket. Do no wrong. He's a god. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, but then Paul Schaefer stepped in. He said, no, Steve was perfect. You were, you got to check yourself, Randy. Like you started the song too fast. And I thought that was so cool that like the band leader stuck up for the drummer, you know, because I can't picture that guy rushing at all. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a subjective thing. You know, if yeah. someone counts a song off, it's our idea you know it's our um, obligation to to uh to hold that tempo now that that's a relative concept though like i used to work with ike turner and you know he's got he, he's got a reputation that precedes him and and I, i'll tell you that it, it's not like that you know he he wasn't you know the the monster that he was made out to be he was yeah. we actually had a really good relationship and you know except i would quit every you know two years <laughs> You know, how did, how did just briefly, how did the, how did you get into that? How did I get into that? Okay. Well, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. I grew up around the, a lot of blues. Uh, I grew up around a lot of, uh, that type of music. And, and so, you know, I, my feel of music, I guess, is steeped in a certain thing. And so, uh, when I met Ike, uh, it was through a friend of mine who we had played, uh, in a band at a restaurant in the 1990s, probably 91, 92. And uh, it was uh, 2001, my friend Kevin, the bass player who I played with in the restaurant, he said to me, uh, hey, you know, Ike's looking for a new drummer. And I was like, Ike Turner? And he says, yeah. I said, well, I, I think that might be kind of interesting. I mean, what could, you know, I mean, that, what could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> but yeah. uh, it was very interesting. And uh, I went in and I played and I have this thing where I bounce my left leg, you know, because of, you know, I'm constantly playing on the hi-hat and Ike does the same thing or he did the same thing with his left foot. And he, 
he turned around and looked and he stared at my foot and and he looked over at Kevin and and he stopped he said, stop 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 he says man you, that thing you do with your foot man you do that all the time I said yeah he goes man you're the drummer of my soul I do the thing. <laughs> So yeah, I, I'll take what I can get, and I, me being the drummer of Ike Turner's soul, I, I'll take that. That's a pretty good compliment. And so um, I did his uh, last album with him, and that one won a Grammy in 2006 for Best Traditional Blues, and uh, and I went on to do other things outside of that, and you know, basically uh, ended up being the drummer with Paul Gilbert. <laughs> yeah, just I, I want to get to that real quick, but I wanted to say with the left foot, I used to work uh, for three years for a, uh, a school that's a very popular franchise, and then I left and started my own thing. And the one thing I knew about beginning drummers who are good and, and then intermediate drummers is they all forgot about their left foot. Yeah. It's like, we're, it, and it, it's a practical thing. It's very important. It's like, I don't understand why the, the, the real younger drummers aren't that that isn't um, instilled in them, like the purpose of it and stuff. I just thought that was really curious, you know, because I remember like, I think I took one lesson like way back when I was starting or whatever. And it's like right day one, it's like, you gotta, you gotta get that thing going. There's a purpose to it. It's timekeeping, you know, it's, uh, it, it's for what I tell people, it, it's like, you, you know, when you're playing drums, you're, you're distributing energy. And, and we as musicians, we're, we're energy brokers. You know, we, we take thoughts and turn them into sound and we distribute those sounds towards uh, a willing or not so willing audience. And we have the ability to either pull people in with that energy or drive them away. And the idea usually is to pull people in. And so, you know, doing, using dynamics, uh, the, the, the talent of the musicians, the quirkiness of the tunes all those elements fit together to you know to draw people in as an audience and you know then there's the visual part of it you know people playing instruments which is you know becoming you know kind of like almost a dying thing in a way because it's so much more convenient to get a guy with two turntables and a box and sit up there on and push a button and you know get everybody drinking and you know that's clubs got to make money right that's why they have like the dance party night you know after the bands are you know, usually after the bands and places that I've played anyway. Not only that, but I'm sure like Mike, uh, you know, in the early aughts or whatever, I played in more like aggressive, alt, screamy kind of bands and where there's a lot of sudden stops and then the whole band jumps up, you know, and the singer is really looking for that visual cue because it's complete silence. You know, no one's saying one, two, three, four. It's, it's made more for a dramatic effect. So, you know, there's timekeeping like you're going around soloing and, it, and it's helping you. And then there's also visual timekeeping with that left foot that the singer can clue in on, you know, so give them just one little beat before everyone's syncopated and then yep. comes back and the beat drops. You know, I want to speak to uh, timekeeping with singers too. One thing that, uh, that I've learned over the years is that uh, when a singer can sing comfortably and not feel like they have to drag the music or the music's pushing them too hard, to where you know it it causes their vocal performance to to be you know affected you know and when a singer can sing you know comfortably that's when you have nailed the tempo and that's the end of the argument that's that's what i've discovered anyway over my uh years of doing this and uh like uh just having having the empathy to to open up and and listen and, and you have to hear with your eyes too you know because a singer if, if a singer looks like, or, or if a musician looks like they're struggling, you know, just lay it back a little bit. And that usually will, uh, you know, fix the problem. Trying to be so metronomic and, you know, like, here's the tempo over here, dumbass. You know, yeah. you can't do that. You know, it's like, sometimes it's better to be empathetic and just kind of like, just, you know, open up and just play simpler and relax to that part and let that person get that thing that they're trying to do out. Yeah. yeah, or they can't hold the note. Dude, I can't hold the note that long, or I can't fit all my words in. Like, yeah. <laughs> you slow it down. Yeah, you know. one of the two things. Yeah, and that's, I think that's why, uh, you know, singers uh, tend to, to, to dig what, you know, I'm able to bring them anyway. Most, most of them do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a few horror stories out there, you know, about singers blowing their lid and all that. And uh, I could tell hundreds of them, but, you know, well, I'm yeah. not drag anybody it's not like <laughs> nah, let's keep it positive Absolutely. Um, 
<clears throat> my first apartment when I moved, when I was a teenager was in Hollywood and I was living with this guy from Michigan who was a guitar player. And I was still into the U2 and the Pretenders and the Fix and Missing Persons, all this stuff. And he was really into Racer X. And he's like, man, I'm gonna play Racer X all day long. I was like, who's this Racer X, you know? So that was the first time that I was introduced to Paul Gilbert. So can you tell me how you got into that? Yeah, well, it's one of those things about being in the right place at the right time. Um, yep. you know, network, yeah. Network, and, and you never know what anything is going to lead to. You just never know. Like I got called to do, uh, to be the, the drum instructor at a, uh, uh, a guitar camp one year in San Marcos, California. I lived in San Diego, and so I just drove up to San Marcos and hung there and uh, went to uh, University of California, San Marcos, uh, and turns out I had one student. There was one drummer that, that signed up, and it was uh, this uh, gender dysphoric uh, young uh, lady. She uh, was, you know, flipping, you know, flipping the channel, and and so it was, a, it was a really cool lesson and, and within the course of the week, because I was just able to focus with one person, uh, I put her in the position to where she got to play with every one of the uh, band, you know, the ensembles, like the beginner, intermediate, advanced ensembles that played. And I basically taught her how to, you know, negotiate and handle all the, the musical, uh, you know, things that were going to befall you in any given moment and there was a couple of snags but the thing is is that she went out and nailed the gig and anyways the first night we had like the special guests come in we had Rhonda Smith and uh I went up and said hello how are you and a friend of mine uh John Blackwell was her was Prince's drummer for a long time and we spoke about John and he hadn't he hadn't passed away yet he was still alive back then he died and and then uh so she says, well, I've got tracks. Okay, no problem. So the next night, Stu Ham was there, and he's like, uh, I'm like, hey, I'm the drummer here, and uh, I'm happy to play with you. And, no, thanks, dude. I got tracks. Uh -oh, okay. <laughs> the third night, Paul Gilbert is the, uh, the, the special guest. And I'm like, hey, Paul, how you doing, man? I'm Bill. Uh, love your stuff. You know, you probably got some tracks to play, too, but I'm the drummer. He goes, you know any Hendrix? And I was like, oh, yeah, do I know some Hendrix? <laughs> So we sat down and started playing and it just, everything just like collapsed into place just as like it should have. It was just like everything just laid perfectly. And, and he was talking about Robin Trower bridge of size and started playing the lick. And then I just started, I came in and that's a really grindy, slow song. I mean, it's so easy to rush that tune, but we ended up playing the whole thing. And, and uh, it, that was this completely impromptu. So after, you know, the, the, buzz of the evening wore off and all that Paul and I got to talk and I said yeah you know I'm a I'm about to move to Seattle and and uh you know uh I know you're in LA and he goes well my wife and I are about to move up to uh Portland hmm. I said, really? well that's only three hours away so he says yeah I'll call you you know or, or let's get in touch you know let me know when you're up there and settle I said okay so I drop a uh in you know email to him back like in March of 2016 and and he's like great can you come down and record with me Oh yeah. <laughs> so I went down and I recorded two songs with him and Damien Erskine at, uh, at a studio, Opal studios over there in Portland, whatever part it is. And, uh, we, uh, we, we did the session and then I didn't hear anything from him and I never heard the tracks or anything. And I was like, well, he probably got Thomas Lang to replace him or what, you know, <laughs> part. So it was in 2018. I was at, uh, uh, golly, I was actually doing a gig with, uh, Miss D at, uh, the, what's that place in Mill Creek? I was, uh, hmm. Peebos. yeah, I was at Peebo's and we were on break and I was sitting at the bar, just kind of going through emails and see this email from Paul Gilbert. And he says, uh, can you do some tour dates on the East coast in September, which was like later on in the month. And I said, yeah, sure. And he said, so he emails me back. He's like, well, can you, uh, here's the second question. Can you come down to Portland and finish my album? I was like, come to Portland and finish your album. Let me think about that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, of course. And uh, what had happened was, is the drummer he used is, uh, he had been using um, this guy, Brian Foxworth. He's a great, great drummer. He's so great, as a matter of fact, that he plays all the freaking time. I mean, he's constantly mm -hmm. 
he was doing the sessions in the day and then going out and gigging at night. When he, uh, he ran himself, he, he was burning the candle at both ends and in the middle and he ended up, uh, passed out on the kitchen floor on a Friday morning. I mean, he had just was exhausted and they couldn't wake him up. So the ambulance came and wow. it was, it was unfortunate, you know? Um, I mean, I understand, I know how he feels cause man, you know, being a professional working musician, you take what gigs you can get. And, and I know all about trying to get those gigs, man. And, and being, you know, that, uh, you know, being that tired, I've been there, man. And I mean, I've almost yeah. crashed the car on the way home from gigs, you know, falling asleep, you know, from like Vegas, but you know, it, that's, yeah, and it could have been part of my story too. I mean, I was coming home really late. It was like two yeah. in the morning. So, well, you know, and then you got drunks to hand to contend with. And I mean, like my brother got rear ended like by this drunk one time going up the five from uh, San Diego, like going across uh, Del Mar right between say like uh, Del Mar Heights and Loma Santa Fe, right on that one stretch. Some guy hit him doing 120 rear ended him. My brother had to speed up to 90. So he didn't get, you know, creamed too bad. He saw it coming. There's not, man, we're not going to, this guy's going to hit us. And sure enough. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. I'm a, a little, I mean, I, I drive past the crash scene all the time, but it's, uh, things have definitely changed. He, um, he's a bitch, man. <laughs> I, hey, uh, so I hear you, uh, you, you taught kind of a famous guy in, from Orange County you know, back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. You know, I was, um, I was the instructor at Orange County Drum and Percussion when it was a drum shop. It used to be a shop right there on Lake Forest, right next to the Sea-Doo place. Uh, and I used to teach there. Uh, we had um, this little room in the back. Uh, they'd be building drums in the warehouse area, and they had a room off to the side where uh, I was teaching lessons. And I had probably 25 students there. And uh, during the day, in the early day, you know, I'd be there hanging out and, uh, like Taylor Hawkins would come walk in. He was 16 at the time and he'd go in the back and he, he asked if he could use my practice room to, uh, to go and, uh, you know, work on some audition material. Hmm. Turns out it was the Alanis Morissette, uh, Jagged Little Pill album that he was auditioning for. And he ended up, you know, getting that gig. And, uh, man, when I went back in there, all the symbols on the on one of the kits was they were just destroyed. I mean, I had the right symbol had like a tear halfway up into it. Oh my god! The crap out of them was funny as hell. I mean, that was not my personal gear. It was the drum shop's gear, and yeah, you know, if something broke, they would just I'd go out on this floor and get you know whatever piece of gear they had because they were constantly taking in new symbols and stuff. And yeah, you know, it was it was it was glorious times. But yeah, Adrian Young, they were about to do a. Uh, Tragic Kingdom and Dan Jensen, who is now the uh, drum tech for Travis Barker, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, Dan said, hey, you know, I've got this uh, friend of mine who is, uh, his band's about to go record for whatever label. And can you, uh, can you teach him how to play to a click track? And I was like, sure, I can do that. So, um, yeah, I, I went and went up to that house in Anaheim on Beacon Street. I remember they did, you know, an album based on that. And I taught him in that house and Gwen Stefani and Tony, uh, the Tony guy came in and, uh, you know, I was hanging in the, the no doubt in the, in the womb. <laughs> and, uh, wow. then I didn't see him for three and a half years. And he calls me on the phone. He's like, Hey man, uh, I want to do another drum lesson when I get off the road. I said, where you been? He's like I've been on the road for three and a half years, man. We've been touring this whole album. We just haven't stopped. And I'm like, really? Yeah. And it's like 50 million albums sold. And so, yeah. and then I gave him another lesson after that. And, and that was the last time I, I really heard from him. Uh, Adrian was an interesting guy. I, I have to tell you too, one of those other things about uh, another story about being, you know, someplace and, and showing up. Um, I used to play in San Diego at this place behind the sports arena. It was my rehearsal hall. It was called Soundtracks. And in that place, uh, there was another guy that had a band and his name was Dean. And uh, he was a friend of a sax player that I played with. And so Dean comes in and, and we, we jammed together one day and, and, you know, really great player. And I start, you know, asking him, you know, like, what do you, you know, what's your band? He goes, well, my brother has a band. My brother and I have a band in LA. We want you to be the drummer in it. He says, you know, I, I really want you to be the guy. I said, okay, well, that's cool. He says, come up to LA on Sunday to, you know, this address and uh, we're going to have a rehearsal. And, and I think he says, dude, you're in, he says, I, I, 
and know you're going to be the guy. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, that Saturday night at my gig, I was playing at Chuck's Steakhouse uh, in La Jolla uh, with Kevin Cooper, that bass player. Yeah. And I had this huge fight with my girlfriend at the time and, you know, young lovers, uh, I was pissed off or whatever. So I left all my drums at the club and I got in my car, well, I had my van and I drove home and parked it and uh, went inside and went to sleep. And the next day I was going to get up and then go run down and pick up my drums and head to LA. Except I went out there in the, in the, uh, where I parked my van or where I thought I parked my van and there was no van. My van had been stolen. Somebody took my van. So I didn't want to ask my girlfriend at the time for a ride to LA. So I kind of boned out on those guys. I didn't really call or anything. And then later I get this angry phone call on my message machine. Dude, we waited all day. Da, 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 da. So I was like, okay, you know, I just kind of blew it off. And then, so Dean would call me and, you know, like later on and say, Hey, you know, you want to come to my gig today, uh, tonight, you know, it's down in the gas lamp at this place, the pool hall. And, uh, I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, I'd go down and, and watch them. And then my friend, uh, Errol was the guitar tech for Dean. And it turns out they had to change their name from mighty Joe young because of Disney coming after him, you know, saying you can't name your band that. And so they had to change the name of the band. And so they, uh, decided to change the name to the Stone Temple Pilots. So if I had gone to that audition that yeah. day, chances are I probably would have been uh, one of the Stone Temple Pilots. But that's uh, wow. that's what happens, you know. You you never know what is behind the door that you're about to go through, you know. Meet people. I talk to kids all the time about this. Meet people. Be prepared. Practice, of course. But uh, and don't be a jerk. <laughs> Yeah, don't be a jerk. Things will happen. Things will happen. Yeah, be the guy that you want to be stuck in a van with for 10 hours at a time. Mm -hmm. Be the guy that you want to be like in an airport getting shaken down, you know, and, and uh, uh, everybody's like on edge. And, and, and if all it's going to take is one person to lose their shit and, and then, you know, the whole thing melts down and then everybody gets deported. Yeah, be, be the guy that doesn't do that, you know that guy because it's like really it's you're you're only on stage for like an hour and a half two hours well if you count sound check like three four hours maybe at a time and the rest of the time you're either shoved into a, a space together or you're not you know and so yeah. you have to be the person who uh who wants to hang out you know who people want to hang out with you have to just kind of like go with the flow and you're not going to get your way 90 99 percent of the time but you might and yeah. You know, it's just a matter of just doing, you know, being, being a good, uh, being a good doobie. <laughs> yeah, I hear that a lot. Yeah. Um, so the channel is about physical maintenance as a working musician and um, coming back from injuries to get back to where you were or where your ego thinks you were. Um, so <laughs> I, I had a crash, uh, broken ribs, concussion, my left ear was hanging off. I had spine surgery. And so that was last year. I'm, I think I'm at about 70, 75% back now, but I'm, I've had to like, you know, baby step my way back and figure out my muscles. There's nerve damage and, and how, um, how my dorsiflexion with the, the feet and the ankles and, and the uh, quad muscles and all, and the hip muscles and all this stuff as a drummer fits together. Um, and there's a lot of things uh, with your, with my legs, especially like that you take for granted as a drummer, which, like just for instance, <clears throat> like the kick pattern that's like the heartbeat versus on the beat actually takes to me as an injured person actually takes different muscles. And I explained that to Greg Bissonette and he's like, ah, I really can't tell the difference. It definitely does. So I was, I was wondering if you, if you did that, like, do you feel anything different going on with the shift of your foot? Or, the, or what kind of muscles you're using in your legs? Well, I don't have any kind of debilitation in my left extremities. So um, yeah. that's the first thing. Uh, my debilitation is in my hands. I have arthritis in my thumbs that started, started here in the, the palms, and now it's working its way up to the joints. And it's, uh, it makes for some interesting feelings, you know, like, if you ever wondered what it feels like to have like maybe, you know, uh, I know how the Tin Man feels, you know, feel your, your bones kind of like 
creaking and like like grating against each other. It's an odd feeling. That's some bone spurs, probably. Well, mm-hmm. There is a bone spur in one, and and the other one, uh, it's just the cartilage is is dissolving. You know, that's what's happening. Is is I'll have to end up getting cortisone shots. The alternative is a surgery that my sister had, mm-hmm. and what they do is they take out the uh, the 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 triangle part of the bone in here, and they uh, it's like the socket. They take the socket part out, just remove it completely, and then they push. Uh, she had to have a rod stuck into into her hand, uh, and it just sat there for like uh, six weeks, you know, protruding out of her hand in a cast. And the reason why is it had to build up scar tissue around the rod down inside her hand in order for them to be able to stitch the the ball sock the ball part into that little pocket of round you know scar tissue and they stitch it up and tie it in there. And that is how the surgery and the recovery time is like at least a year. And wow. it would be a total career ender for me. I could not, I couldn't do it. So the other alternative is just to figure out how to, you know, use what I got and to keep it moving, you know, and, and working for me. So do you do anything consistently for uh, pain maintenance, whether it be like supplements or any kind of you know, um, lotions or, or anything like that before or after you play? Well, for me, um, magnesium and potassium supplements yes. are definitely, those are going to be like at the top of the list. Um, magnesium works overnight. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Pickle juice, pickle juice is also really good for cramps. It'll stop a cramp cold. If you had a, you know, if you're in the middle of the night, you get a cramp in your leg, get up and hobble over to the fridge and grab that jar of pickle and, you know, and just <sighs> Drink some of the juice, man. It's like, it's just like, boom, it's gone. It's like, wow. whoa. Pickle juice. I'm writing that one down. <laughs> it's, it's a little odd, but it's really, it's, it's got electrolytes. Yeah. It's got what plants crave. <laughs> I've been doing the, um, I've been doing the turmeric, magnesium, Alaskan fish oil. Yep. Um, and then a lot, you know what? I, I never drank water in my life. That sounds crazy. It was always sugary drinks or alcohol or coffee or whatever. I just started drinking a ton of water maybe like four months ago. And I'd have to say some things in my body are definitely healing up or, or clearing up. It's, 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 pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. These seltzer waters, that's mm-hmm. what weaned me off of sodas. I used to have this horrible Diet Coke uh, addiction. I would drink like uh, two 12-packs a day. I mean, I was constantly slamming Diet Cokes, and now these little soda uh, cans of sparkly water, dude, these are the bomb. These, this is what stops me from drinking diet sodas. That'll dry you out, all those sodas. Yeah. And yeah. all the caffeine, too. If yeah. you, do, you are, if whoever's watching this, if you do decide to quit drinking diet sodas, you're going to have to figure out a way to get your caffeine. So uh, iced tea is going to be, you want to slam iced tea which is a lot better for you than Diet Coke, and then you'll get your caffeine, then you can start tapering that off because otherwise, if you quit drinking sodas all overnight, it, you're going to have a hard time. It's really, the headaches are, oh, God, they're horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Um, besides your, your bone issues that you're having to deal with, was there anything um, like during a show or ramping up to a tour or anything where you just overworked yourself and you started feeling something tear or any kind of, uh, you know, like rotator cuff or your arms or anything like that well as you get older you're going to start feeling you know little squeaks and squonks and you know yeah. wrong with you and i'll tell you a funny story um last year we were uh we started the the u.s leg of the tour uh with paul in uh what was it denver uh at the uh at the uh, theater there uh the aladdin the aladdin theater not the aladdin that's important it was the I think it was the Fox Theater down there, and uh, five minutes before we were supposed to play, I'm you know kind of like trying to go back across the backstage area behind the curtain, and I'm walking, and my left foot I I was kind of in a hurry, so my left foot ended up kicking this thing underneath the carpet, and I felt something in the back of my left leg pop, and I pulled my hamstring five minutes before we were supposed to play. And then I felt this thing start to tighten up and all of a sudden I can't walk and I'm hobbling, I'm jumping on one leg. And this is five minutes before the opening show on the freaking tour. Mm-hmm. And I fr- was freaking out inside and, and I had to go out there and 
you know, I'm like, oh shit, you know, is this, am I going to go to the hospital? Is this going to work at all? I don't know what I've done. I just felt something pop. And is it going to snap in the middle of the show? Exactly. Is my leg going to fall off? And so I'm got, I've got that, all that rolling through my head, but I've got to go out here and, and get on stage in front of a packed theater sold out and, and kind of like act like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and, and I managed to get out there and do it and, you know, play the show. And at the end of the night, Oh God, the, the bow at the end of the night, you know, I had to bend over in my leg was, was just freaking, Oh God, that was crazy. But it took like the first two weeks of the tour um, for it to sort of settle down and, you know, work its way out. That was just, that was a crazy night, man. I used to run a lot, like close to 10 miles a day pre-accident. And, uh, you know, I would get excited for a tour coming up and uh, I would, I would push myself even harder. It was almost a form of sabotage. It was really weird. Anytime something cool was about to come up, I'd really prepare, but I'd over prepare and something would snap. So usually when I'm touring, my legs are wrapped up with some kind of you know, compression socks, or I got, uh, I got like some kind of gorilla tape underneath long sleeve shirts or whatever. It's like, for some reason I need some kind of traction, you know, I needed something to work against, which is yeah. a little demented, but well, yeah, you got used to it. You know, some sort of like you know stressor to keep you in like that you know that's why you wrap a muscle or something i've been using the uh the copper uh they're these like these gloves that i put on before i go to sleep at night and they got copper lining them yeah nose at night when i go to sleep and they've been helping they're compression gloves and uh that helps it does help and also like one thing i found uh there's this cream you can get it's got magnesium in it and it really really gets down in there and uh one of the things I also found is that magnesium cream, it's got, because it's got the metals in it, or the, or the minerals or whatever of magnesium, uh, it, it tends to give my grip a little bit more of, uh, just a little more grippiness because uh, it, it's got like this tackiness to it that, mm -hmm. that works in my favor. So not that I have a hard time gripping my sticks, yeah. but um, speaking of gripping sticks, you know, with arthritis, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, that, you know, playing, uh, I have to remain really, really loose when I, when I play, because otherwise, you know, I can't pinch like this, this kind of stuff right here, trying to do screws. Like one time I had to take the, the keyboard out of my old MacBook pro yeah. and I got to sit there and do this. This is torture, like doing little tiny, you know, motor skills like that. So if I pinch on a drumstick like that, I immediately start feeling it. So all of my grip is like right back here hmm. gives me more power because it's the farthest point from the rotational axis. And now I just put my thumb here and then everything comes from these back two fingers. And this acts as a, my index finger acts as a tensioner, like on a 10 speed wheel, a 10 speed bike chain. Yeah. That's my grip right there is, is it's all in the back of my hand with those fingers. And you see it, it lets me, it lets my hand open up. And, and, and everything just kind of floats. Yeah, there, like that, you can see it. Yeah, much easier on your joints. Yeah. Oh, it is way easier. And, and with my left hand, I play traditional grip most of the time. Yeah. But all of my technique, uh, I come from uh, the Alex Duthert school of, of traditional grip, which he was a Scottish pipe band drummer, mm -hmm. the father of modern uh, pipe band drumming. You see my thumb, how this works? Yeah. Basically, if I take my, uh, my hand and lay it flat on its side, <laughs> It's like bouncing a, bouncing a ball, with, but I'm just using my thumb, and you see all my fingers are, are very loose. Yeah. Everything comes off the thumb like that. So it allows me to, you know, the range of motion. You know, I'm not, I'm not bound by this, or, you know, it's like that sort of thing. Yeah. I, can, I can really, you know, come from way back and, and get a nice, strong stroke. The grip, yeah. Then in Harbor View, when you or when you have a spine injury, they always come in and they do a, a handshake test where you try to grip them as hard as you can to see your progression. And so um, coming back, getting a grip again as a drummer has, has been interesting. I actually went to Home Depot once, maybe three weeks after getting out of the hospital and I bought this tape that you're supposed to put on wet stairs. And yeah. it's, really, it's really gritty, almost like dirt. And I mm. wrapped those around the sticks because the grip was very bad in the beginning, yeah. Yeah. Definitely helped. You know what? One thing that happened to me, and this is something that we all need to pay attention to, is uh, our ergonomic uh, setup. Like, what's your computer desk setup like? Like, the place where I was uh, 
living at the time, my computer table sat up a little bit high and I had to cock my wrists like this, you know, at an angle in order to type. And all of a sudden I started losing all the feeling on the top of my arm right here. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't hold a stick by the back of my fingers. I had to hold a stick like this. I mean, I was playing six nights a week too. So I ended up having to play the ride symbol like that rather than my normal like that, you know? Mm. A buddy of mine who's a bass player, I told him what was happening. He says, yeah, it seems like you got a, you got a pinched nerve or something. He says, come down to my acup acupuncture clinic. And I was total skeptic. He says, just come in. I want to give you a session or two for free. I want you to see what it's, if, if it helps. I said, okay, cool. So I went down to Acolino's place, and uh, they set me up, and he comes in and sticks the needles in me, and, you know, I'm like in my back and all that. And then I had a gig that night. I went to the gig, and I swear to you, man, I could, I was using my full range and all that. And, and as the gig went on, you know, like towards the end of the night, I started feeling like I had to get back up in here in order to move it. But, but I made it through the first three sets in a four set night. And wow. I went back the next couple, you know, a few days later before I had another gig and I had the same thing done and the acupuncture, it, it solved it. And then, and he said also, you know, you have to look at your ergonomic situation. He says, because something causing that nerve to get pinched. Um, I got a pinched nerve in my left arm one time by, you know, having my arm up in the car window when I was driving around, you know, cause you're in Southern California and that's nice. You roll down the windows and put your arm in the window. And the next thing you know, you're, you know, pinching your nerves and you don't even realize it. <laughs> yeah. So those things, they're degradative, you know, degradative, degradative. Tried it all. I've tried the acupuncture, tried the deep. I'm doing something now called muscle activation technique with a specialist over in uh, Redmond. And um, he, work, he usually works with fighters, like MMA fighters and stuff like that, and athletes. And that, that's been interesting. Um, what they do is kind of secretive. Like, I couldn't even video him, video him describing it because of policy. So, right. so I'm like, I'm going, I'm going all over the place trying to, find, trying to outsmart my spine. Mm. Hey, um, where can everyone find you? What's the best way? It's billray.com. BillRayDrums.com. BillRayDrums.com. And then people will inadvertently type in BillyRayDrums.com, but that's okay. Yeah. I own that one too. It just more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I was going to go over um, your endorsements unless you wanted to do it yourself. Well, no, man. Uh, thank yous. Yeah. Well, thanks to Sabian Symbols. Thanks to Promark drumsticks, the Dario company, uh, Aquarian drum heads, uh, who else? Golly slug percussion products. Um, uh, Audix mics. Uh, who, who else have I, there's a ton. Uh, I'm not DW, but, uh, 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 what? TNR. Humes and Berg. Edematic. Edematic. Hell yeah. Edematic. They're my ear people. I'm using my, uh, I've been using these, uh, I can't speak the name, but, uh, they're, uh, another stick company's uh drummers cans okay yeah but uh, slug percussion slug percussion man been that was my first endorsement since 1994 wow cool i just broke the shaft on one of my beaters <laughs> i mean it was i had had that one beater for 26 years and finally the shaft broke because anytime you get new heads on the beaters you just send him the shafts back and he replaces the heads and it's kind of a it's a cool thing and he's got great products eric eric Bairdfeld. Got it. Um, so, of course, all touring has been put on hold. Did you have something set up that you had to shut down? Well, we were going to get into the studio in April. We had the dates booked. We had the Airbnbs booked and everything. I was going to go to Portland, and we were going to start recording the album around uh, April 11th. And then we had uh, the Dallas Guitar Show and the uh, uh, guitar, uh, Guitars de Le Monde, and uh, that was in... Uh, Quebec, Canada. And then we had, uh, the, we were going to do a tour in the summer, but, uh, our management didn't get on it, uh, for whatever, you know, I don't know, I guess after the whole world tour last year, they didn't start setting things up until, you know, March. And, uh, so the gigs were going to start rolling in around say like, uh, September, but it looks like everything's on hold for this year. Yeah. I mean, so you're going to be doing a lot of lessons you do online lessons right oh, i can do online lessons yeah go to billraydrums.com and uh, check him out and pay him for you to become a better musician that's what yeah. i say i'll take your money yeah hey <laughs> thanks for spending the time bill good it's cool to get to know you a little better you blake put our faces together
Yeah, well, let's let's hang out. I mean, Burke. I called you Blake, Burke. Yeah. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah. yeah, I get called Billy Ray all the time. It's okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, thanks again. I'm gonna actually stop recording, and I'm gonna talk to you just for two seconds after that. Okay. See ya.